Welcome back to Mr. Scare. For today's episode, I have a compilation of highway horror stories that will give you chills. So I'll begin reading the stories now. And meanwhile, make sure that you've subscribed to Mr. Scare for daily horror podcasts. I had a pretty creepy experience while I was driving in Brisbane, Australia. Luckily, I was not alone at that hour. I was driving home with some friends in the car, and we saw this guy dressed like an invisible man. He was freakishly tall and very thin, head and hands completely wrapped in bandages, wearing a trench coat and fedora-type hat, just walking down the middle of a busy motorway. As we drove past him, he moved his head to follow our car, but we couldn't see if there was any way for him to see through the bandages. We absolutely shit ourselves and started yelling at one another since we were extremely terrified. Now being the driver, I decided to pull into a side street and turn around to get back on the main road and try to get another look at him. But literally 15 seconds after we first spotted him, he was gone. No trace of him whatsoever. We started to drive home again, all wondering as to what the hell had just happened, and as we turned into our little street in a neighborhood that was like a labyrinth on a hill, my heart sank as I noticed this towering motherfucker walking towards us on our very own damn street. Not only was it frightening to see that he had watched us drive by, and had somehow managed to end up on our street. Also for perspective, the distance from the very first sighting to my home was about 3 miles, and he had made that distance, on foot, in about 10 minutes. We kept driving around for hours that night, too scared to go home, and eventually, when we decided to get home, there was no sight of him. So we locked every door and window, while sitting with makeshift weapons in the living room all night. I still don't have any explanation for it, and no one else that I've ever spoken to about it, has ever seen the thing, or even anything close to it for that matter. We lived right near one of the largest cemeteries in Australia, and many strange people hung around there, but this guy was too tall and too freaky to be a real human. I didn't feel safe in that neighborhood for a long time after that, and I moved as soon as I could. Luckily, I never spotted him ever again. In a small town in the southern part of America where I grew up, there was a highway that was almost never used. It was always claimed to be a huge waste of resources, because despite being a large four-lane highway, it doesn't really connect any two major destinations. Although it does lead into the city of the major state university that is a couple of hours away. My dad told me the only reason they built it was because some alumni pushed for its construction so that people had an alternate route to get to the university during football season. It never made any sense to me, but whatever. One night, my girlfriend and I were driving on this highway, where there is a rare occurrence to see another car on a non-game day in the fall. And there was a guy standing in the middle of the road. There weren't any lights on the road. And since it was completely dark, we almost hit this guy that was staring blankly ahead watching us nearly hit him. And the most appalling part is that he never flinched. Just kept staring past our vehicle, pale as a ghost, wearing all black and no footwear. My immediate thought after we avoid killing this dude is... Oh shit, he's a meth head that has wandered out of the woods somewhere! But he was fairly young and didn't have the look of someone that was high on drugs. He never bothered to even look at us, and just kept staring into the distance endlessly. I rolled the window down to ask him if he was alright, by which he snapped out of his gaze and walked to the side of our car. He said he had been in an accident, and then he kind of stammered out a story. He was definitely in shock, but things weren't adding up. He was saying he rolled his car, but there was no car around. There are rows of pine trees on both sides of the road, so his car couldn't have rolled very far. He wasn't aggressive in any way, and he didn't seem to be intoxicated, apart from having a far-off stare. And the strangest part of the entire encounter was the way he asked for a ride. It wasn't like a typical, Hey man, my car is gone and I don't have a phone. Can you give me a lift to my house? He kept repeating himself over and over again. Will you please invite me into your vehicle? He seemed stranded and I didn't want to just leave this young guy who, besides being shoeless in the middle of an empty highway wearing all black, seemed like a fairly clean dude, but I had this knot in my stomach. 
I was about to drive him to the closest gas station when I, probably just recovering from the adrenaline dump of having nearly run over someone, noticed he had no wounds or blood on him. I told him we didn't have phones, and to wait by the side of the road while we drove to the convenience store to call the police and drove off. In the rear view, he just stood there watching us drive away, exactly how he watched us ride up on him. As soon as we rode off, my girlfriend said that she thought he might have been a vampire. I mean we saw no wrecked car on the remaining stretch of highway, and the police never caught up with him to see what his deal was, but it was freaky as shit. And I have heard that vampires require consent. Maybe that's why he kept asking for our permission. One summer night when I first met my boyfriend, we decided to drive to Charleston in South Carolina to visit my sister. Now just so you know, that specific part of South Carolina is still a very old world and gives off freakishly haunted vibes. I mean the trees here are draped with Spanish moss and it is hot and humid and bug infested. The whole scene was straight out of a horror movie. As the sun started to go down, it began to cool down and so we started waking up. My car had no air conditioner, so we were overheated and silent. It was rapidly getting dark when I realized that there were no street lights out there. No street lights and we hadn't passed a gas station in a very long time. We weren't even driving past any other drivers anymore. I asked my boyfriend if he wanted to drive and he willingly obliged. Now that part of South Carolina is flat. The roads are straight and there are fields and trees and swamps on either side. Far ahead I could see a light that was maybe a street light of some kind. I planned on pulling over there to change places. I started slowing down as we got closer to the spot. We almost slowed down to stop and that's when I saw that the light ahead was moving. And it wasn't light. It was the fire. It was a car on flames. It was in the middle of nowhere engulfed in flames and burning on the side of the road with no one around. I was so bewildered by what I saw that I'd taken my foot off the gas. My boyfriend was alarmed. Go! Go! And I put my foot down. He then told me there were a couple of people standing just in the line of trees. They hunkered down at first, but when I slowed down, they stood up. This was before the era of smartphones. We just fled from there. There was no mention of anything about it on the radio or in the paper in the next few days. The moral of the story is, do not stop in unknown places, especially where there's room for people to hide nearby and ambush your vehicle. About three months ago, I was on my way home from work. I was driving late at night, around 1 a.m. The road was pretty empty, and I was just listening to some songs, excited to just hop in my bed the moment I get home. But off in the far distance, as I was driving along, I saw a large figure lying down on the side of the road. The first thought I had was that it was a deer, or some large animal that had been hit by a car, and pulled off to the side. But as I got closer, it started to look more and more like a human. Sure enough, my light shined right on it as I passed. It was a man, and for the second I got a look at him, he might have been missing his head. I still don't remember it completely sure, but a part of me doesn't want to. My mouth just fell open and I just stared at the road ahead, trying to make sense of what I had just seen. There was no one around, except for about 200 feet away, where a woman and her passenger were pulled over and frantically speaking outside of their van. As I kept driving, I saw more and more people pulled over and talking to each other. I'm confident that they had obviously seen him too. I couldn't believe it until I saw him on the news the next morning, and sure enough, it was the woman in the van who hit him. There was no explanation as to what he was doing walking on the side of the interstate that 2 at 1 a.m. About 15 years ago, I was in my mid-twenties. On an exhausting long trip from Washington State to Montana, I was driving through North Dakota, through that long boring stretch. It was late at night and we hadn't stopped for a long time, aiming to do the whole stint in a day. I began to notice a truck that crept up slowly behind me, but hadn't passed for a long while. 
I sensed a weird feeling, so I mess with my speed. Up to 90, down to 30, but the driver behind me maintained his pace. I'm down to barely a quarter tank, so I pull off at the next sign of a gas station. The truck follows us there too. I'm scared and freaking out, wondering if I should call the police. And what do I tell them? It sounded dumb that a car on the highway is going in the same direction as me. I finally wake my sister, and she tells me to chill. Two gas stations were in sight. One was open and had no cars, while the other one is closed but with two troopers pulled on having a chat. Thank God. But as I pull into the sweet safety of law enforcement, they both pull away. And the truck is still following me. I pull up to the pump, my heart is racing, but my sister just orders me to fill it up. As I climb out, I see two dudes get out of the truck and watch me. I think that this is where we get kidnapped, raped, and murdered. But I get to work and my sister slides out of the passenger seat. She lights a cigarette and starts to talk to the gents. She asks where they're headed, they say Duluth. As I'm screwing the gas cap on, my sister, cool as a cucumber, flips open her phone and takes a pic of their truck in them. She bids them safe travel and climbs back in. Both of our cars get on the highway again. They pass us and speed away. We reach the place safely. One time I was driving with my girlfriend through Wisconsin on the way back home. It was really late, like 1 or 2 in the morning, and I stopped at a gas station to fill up my tank. My GPS ended up putting me on a small highway instead of the expressway right away, after leaving from there, but I didn't want to complicate things more, so I just followed it. My girlfriend was sleeping, so I had the radio turned off, and drove in complete silence on this really dark, creepy highway. There were deer crossing signs, so I was driving extra cautiously because a family friend had recently hit a deer in their truck, which did quite a number on it and also caused her to break her arm from the impact. I saw there was a pretty sharp curve coming up, so I slowed down to make the turn as carefully as possible, and as I'm turning I see a figure exiting in the darkness of the woods. It was a large mountain lion, with blood stained all over the front of its face. It literally scared the fuck out of me. I pulled up just after the turn and tried to wake my girlfriend up. I could see its large shadow make its way across the road in my rearview mirror, but by the time my girlfriend woke up it was gone. She had lived in Wisconsin most of her life and immediately dismissed my claims that it was a mountain lion, because they are not really from that area. I told her I knew what I saw, but she insisted that I was seeing things. I acted like she was probably right and continued the trip back, but I know what I saw. I remember that one night my wife and I couldn't get our two-year-old and one-year-old to go to sleep. They were driving the both of us a little crazy with their constant crying, and the worst part is that none of our usual strategies were working, and it was making us aggressive at each other. I suggested an evening drive to calm everyone down, and my wife was more than relieved at the idea. We quickly packed up the kids and headed out. The idea was to take a typically quiet county highway for a few miles to the interstate, drive about 10 to 12 miles west, then turn around and come home. The stretch of this county highway is particularly lacking in street lights, especially considering that it's located in the busy suburbs of the New York City. We had just left the local road leading to the county highway and gotten up to speed, which was about 50 miles per hour, when I spotted something in the road ahead. This stretch of the highway was frequently crossed by deers and other animals, and it's not uncommon for freshly struck carcasses to be littered with them. By the time I alerted my wife that there was something in the road, we were passing it, and it definitely wasn't a deer. We were traveling in the middle lane, on a dark highway, doing 50 miles per hour, and a person was crossing the fast lane into the path of our car. I don't think my wife and I would have been so chilled by someone crossing this section of the road, had it not been for the rest of the circumstances. Firstly, as mentioned previously too, we were already a little rattled at each other with the kids not complying with their usual bedtime routine. Next, while my wife was glad to get out of the house on this particular night, such so-called nap rights had become a thing of the past, ever since our second child was born. 
Not only was it twice the work to pack and unpack the kids in and out of the car, but we also had twice the precious cargo to keep safe. It just didn't seem worth the trouble and risk most of the times. Although this was an exception. Perhaps the thing that shook us both the deepest out on that dark section of highway was that there were absolutely no cars in front or behind us. This person didn't have to cross at that time. They could have crossed with zero risk either 15 seconds earlier or later of us passing by. Finally, I thought the person was holding a big stick or bat. My wife didn't see this, but she also was not the first to spot the person. This stick was what tipped the scale and triggered us to call 911. The 911 operator didn't initially think the call deserved a police response. No one had been hurt and she said people cross the highway there on foot all the time. It wasn't until I mentioned that I thought the person had a stick that the operator said she was dispatching someone to check it out. We hung up, relieved that perhaps we'd helped prevent someone who was either crazy or intoxicated, not hurt someone else or themselves. What we didn't know this whole time was that our three-year-old was aware of everything that was happening. He'd not fallen asleep yet and heard us call 911 and specifically mention that a person was in the road. I suspect that he detected we were alarmed, and when we told him it was a deer in the road that we called the police about, he said. But I heard you say a person, not a deer. We felt bad for lying to him, but at the time it seemed like the right thing to do was to persist that it had been a deer and encourage him to go to sleep. We continued on towards the interstate, quietly talking about the circumstances that led us to call the cops, convincing each other that it was the right thing to do. Both kids were sound asleep by the time we made it to the juncture where I'd planned to turn around. I don't usually take the same way back home from places, mostly just for a change of scenery, and this is what I had planned to do on this night. As we took the eastbound service road towards the alternate route home, traffic came to a stop because of a car accident ahead. There was still an opportunity to take the same interstate back, so I took it, somewhat relieved that we could pass the same spot where the person was in the road, maybe getting closure that nothing bad had happened. We were only on that same dark county highway heading towards home for a few minutes, when I saw the flashing lights against the trees lining the highway. They were still mostly hidden around a big bend in the road ahead. I slowed down, my heart sinking with my wife's, the both of us already knowing what had happened. We were the first car to be stopped on the highway. From where we were stopped, we could see a car crash near the trees lining on the side. Its glass was shattered from the front, and there were no people visible. But the bat that the man had held before was lying on the road a few yards ahead. As the cop whose car was closest to the body approached our car, I heard stirring in the back seat. Oh no, I thought. Thankfully, just as our three-year popped his head up and asked what was going, an ambulance pulled behind the cop and blocked the view of the body from our child. Before the cop could say anything, we told him what we'd seen right at this spot only 15 minutes before, while heading in the opposite direction. We told him we were the ones who had called the cops while out on our nap ride, and he told us to stay where we were so he could get our info. He returned and told us about the entire incident. Just a few minutes after we drove past the guy on the highway, there was another car. The driver was alone in the car, and he stopped upon watching him standing right in the middle of the road. The moment he slowed down, this dude charged towards him with the bat and struck the windshield. The driver floored his vehicle and bumped him while attempting to escape, subsequently hitting him hard. The crazy guy injured himself quite badly and fell on the side. Three hours later we made that turn on the closed highway, exited the entrance, and went home. In the days that followed, both my wife and I were sad and reflective about the situation. Having to rehash everything to an investigator a week later, we got a closure. The man was supposedly a psycho killer on the loose. There was a charge sheet on him and the local police were already on a lookout. He was notorious for stopping unwary drivers asking for help and then killing them for fun. The police could get there on time to help the injured driver and catch hold of the psycho killer too, 